Well, good morning. If you would open your Bibles to the book of Philippians. <coughs> Philippians. Chapter 1, verse 3, 4, and 5. If you were calculating and you looked up the 104 verses of Philippians in our last two weeks covering one verse and wondered if we were going to be in this four-chapter book for two years, don't be alarmed. We are going to study it very deeply, very richly, but there will be occasions uh, where we'll cover more than just one verse uh, several times throughout the book. So this morning, we are accelerating to a rapid pace, three whole verses uh, this morning to study. Uh, very much looking forward to these verses. One of the ways we, we try to serve uh, the church, and in particular my, my role, is to study the scriptures and ask how do they, how do they naturally organize themselves into sections? Uh, that's one of the jobs of an exegetical preacher is to say what, what sections are present already, what logical connections are present already uh, in the passage. So we don't just randomly pick verses. Now, when you're doing one verse at a time, uh, it makes it a little simpler. Uh, but uh, always the goal is to say there, there are sections in Scripture that work together. We're doing that this morning. Verses 3 through 5 hang together as a group, as a unit. Uh, they make a particular point, and so that's why we're studying them uh, in one clump this morning. Now let's remember, as we read, we want to remember this every week as we read, that this is God's authoritative and transforming word. We are orthodox in our understanding of Scripture. That means we are in keeping with the history of church tradition, that when we read this book, when we hear these words, God himself is speaking, re-speaking them into our hearts. This is not merely the study of some ancient text. This isn't some uh, religious habit that we do where we study this old book called the Bible. We believe this is living and active and that God, by his spirit, is re-speaking it into our hearts, into the hearts of men and women like you and me who are sinful and in need of God's transforming power through his word. So let's read this book with that expectation in mind. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. Not long ago, I had one of those moments I'm sure you've had at the dinner table. I opened something carbonated. I can't remember if it was a soda or some... Uh, special occasion where we had sparkling cider or something. I, I opened something at the table, and unbeknownst to me, there had been some activity uh, generated on this particular beverage uh, by someone. Maybe it was me. I don't know. I'm going to blame my children. But somehow, uh, it wasn't ready for this moment. And so we opened it, and abruptly, there's just stuff falling out all over the place, onto the lid, over spilling onto the table. Uh, some kind of activity had, had, <laughs> had previously been worked on this beverage, and it was overflowing. And I think we could make the same description of the Apostle Paul as he launches in verse 3. Some kind of activity has been going on, and it has affected this man so that when he barely opens the letter, he is bubbling over with enthusiasm. He is excited. He is passionate. I mean, can you imagine any other way he could add another superlative? All, always, all, joy. I mean, just throughout this opening three verses of the body of the letter, He's overflowing, he's bubbling over, and the, the quality that we're most aware of is gratefulness. He's praying, and he's going to get to the content of his intercession later on in verse 9, but before he gets to what he's praying for in requests, he has to first say how much joy and gratefulness comprehensively is present in his prayers and towards this church. 
He's overflowing with gratefulness. I thank my God, he says, always, in all my remembrance of you, in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer, and in case you didn't get the mood, with joy. There's this overwhelming, overflowing abundance of gratefulness. And in these verses, it's for a very specific reason. Paul, of course, is grateful for God's power in creation. He's, of course, very grateful for God's grace in saving him personally. But in these verses, his focus is on gratefulness for their their partnership with him, their camaraderie with him in the gospel. So you notice the structure of of the verse breaks down very simply. He is overflowing in his gratefulness. He describes that gratefulness, and then he talks about the cause of it, because, he says, of your partnership in the gospel. So the two points this morning are the description of his gratefulness and then the cause of his gratefulness, in keeping with the text. The description and then the cause. And all is meant to impress a truth on our hearts today. Gospel partnership should produce abundant gratefulness to God. I want to put that as a banner over this passage and a a test and an evaluation and a motivation for our own hearts. Gospel gratefulness or abundant gratefulness should be the result of gospel partnership. Gospel partnership should produce, it should result in, it should overflow in abundant gratefulness to God. That should be the effect of God's activity of creating gospel partnership, gospel camaraderie, fellowship in Christ and towards the gospel mission. That's the the main claim, I think, of this passage. That's what he's trying to impress on us. So let's look at these two points. First, the description of his gratefulness and then the cause of it, and then we'll apply it very specifically to our church. I thank my God, he says, in describing his gratefulness, in all my remembrance of you, always, in every prayer of mine, for you all, making my prayer with joy. Now, you want to notice the accent here is on the all, all, always, for you all, making my prayer with joy. There's a sense of, of comprehensive gratefulness going on here. But you also, before you get into those comprehensive languages, you want to notice that the direction of this prayer is towards God. This is not merely a social nicety of thanking the Philippians. He is thanking God. The direction of this gratefulness is towards God. God is the source of the partnership he's about to commend. God is the cause of it. God is the fountain of it. What he's about to commend in the Philippian church has a source, and that source is God. He is certainly grateful for the Philippians' financial contribution to his mission. He's grateful for their prayers for him. He's grateful for their camaraderie in suffering with him. He's grateful that they stand with him for Christ in the face of opposition. He's grateful for their partnership and their labors in all of those ways, but he perceives behind those labors the miraculous work of God, taking a formerly pagan colony who was under Roman rule and surrounded by the emperor cult and turning them into people who are eager to to labor for the cause of Christ, he says, there's only one person that can bring that about in you. It is God. And so I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. He is directing this gratefulness. The description of it is that it's directed towards God. Very, very important. When we see grace at work, any kind of grace, in the lives of fellow Christians, it should produce in us a gratefulness to God for the privilege of witnessing what God and God alone could do. But too often, we're unaware of the miracle, and so we don't respond in gratefulness. Listen, when you see something miraculous, spectacular, unique, surprising, often you exclaim. Sometimes you might even text somebody else. We had experience recently, there was some kind of an eclipse happening, and a friend of my wife texted her, hey, there's this great eclipse outside. Well, we, we do that naturally when we're excited about something. Well, gratefulness reveals our real passion. What we're naturally grateful for, it reveals what we're actually excited about. Paul is excited about the miracle of grace turning pagans to partners. He's grateful about that, and he just explodes. He overflows. This is, this is exciting news. I thank my God. What for, Paul? For a warm blanket, for a deliverance from the Roman jail cell you're in? 
Well, sure, if God wants to give that, but you know what's on my mind? These Philippians are partners in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank God for that. That's what gets me excited. That's what gets me sending messages, messages to other people. He's grateful to God. And let's notice these always and alls that are in here. Notice the scope of his gratefulness as he continues to describe. First of all, he's grateful for in, in all of his prayers. Notice that always and in every prayer in verse 4. Always and in every prayer. So whenever Paul prays, he's not saying he, he never thinks about any other thing. This is a, a description of his ongoing prayer life is perpetually described as having gratefulness present. Whenever Paul prays, it is always the case that he is grateful. He is grateful for the Philippians. Does he intercede for them? Yes. He will describe that in verse 9, what he is praying that God would do. But what, what threads through all of those intercessions is this gratefulness to God. Brothers and sisters, we need this in our prayer life. This is true throughout Paul's prayers. You notice, yes, does he intercede? Does he cry out to God for things? Yes, but he always threads his prayers with gratefulness. Because if there is a Christian out there, then a miracle has taken place. And whatever else they need, the place to begin is to celebrate God's grace at work in their life. We need this perspective of others as well. When you see a Christian, you see a walking miracle. Whatever else is going on that we should rightly pray for, we should begin with gratefulness that God has made them one with his son. That's what Paul does. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, every prayer. It, it seems as though there is never an exception to this for Paul. Always in every prayer, making my prayer with joy. Always, 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 he says. Paul considers gratefulness a full-time job. We must consider gratefulness a full-time job. Do you consider gratefulness for your fellow Christians a full-time job? A full-time responsibility. A without exception responsibility. Think of your friends right now, friends you have in this church, fellow laborers, your community group leader, one of your pastors, your laborers on the ministry teams in this church. Does, does your thought of them first spring towards gratefulness. If not, we need to be more amazed at the grace of God. He's always grateful. Every prayer is threaded with gratefulness. Let's be very practical about this. Let me encourage you to build the habit of when you pray, include some element of gratefulness. J just make it a habit. Make it one of those things that you, you, you never don't do. You, you just always do that. You're always constantly starting somewhere, somewhere in your prayer, you're saying, thank you, Lord. Let me encourage you. He is always grateful for the Philippians. And notice also, he is grateful for all of them. Always in every prayer of mine, notice this, for you all. This is very intentional because in the Philippian church, as we'll find out in chapter four, there is conflict taking place. And I think we can surmise, based on chapter 2 and Paul's exhortation towards humility and servant-heartedness, that perhaps there is pride present in the church. So we can imagine that somewhere in the church, there's some level of resentment from one to another, some level of competition, maybe envy is present, maybe some superiority or self-congratulations of, of <laughs> you know, being better than one another is present. So what, what does Paul make very clear? There is not a person in this church that he isn't grateful for. Now, that's good for everyone else to hear. He's not just grateful for some of them and not others. He's not just grateful for the uh, currently mature and not for the immature. He's not just grateful for people who serve in one way and not another way. He's not grateful for some time, kinds of gifts and not other kinds of gifts. He's not grateful for those who are, are currently in a robust spiritual frame and others who are, he's not grateful for those in a weak spiritual frame. He's grateful for all of them. And this is very, very important if we're going to understand the type of gratefulness that Paul uh, has present in his heart. He is grateful for every Christian regardless of their current spiritual maturity or current spiritual condition. What does gospel gratefulness look like? He's describing it here. And always in, in the epistles, Paul uses his example 
as, as a rhetorical exhortation to the people he is writing to. Paul, Paul's not just writing about himself, and there's, there's a lot of biographical information about Paul in the letters. And too often, I think, we skip over that as interesting historical note. Well, he's writing a letter. He had to say something about himself, but the doctrinal parts, that's the part we're supposed to benefit from today. We have to kind of endure his biography and get to his teaching. No, his biography is part of his teaching. Just like your example is part of your teaching to your children, his biography is part of his teaching to us. His gratefulness is meant to transform us. It's meant to define us. It's meant to teach the Philippians how they should view one another. Listen, if Paul can be grateful for this woman with whom Syntyche is in an argument, then she should be grateful too. If Paul can be grateful for the newcomer who has barely confessed Christ and has many immaturities and annoyances and presumptions, then you can be grateful too. If Paul can be grateful for the person who never seems to serve as much as you do, then you can be grateful too. If Paul can be grateful for the person who always speaks too much or speaks too little or says the wrong thing or is annoying or blunt or awkward or selfish or arrogant, then you can be grateful too. He's grateful all the time and for all of them. Now, this... Before he even gets to the the partnership cause, this should affect us. This is what a gospel, Christ-centered man looks like. Let's ask the question. Are we grateful all the time for all of them? All the time for all of them. Let me me just, just let faces pass through your mind. All the time for all of them. Now, there's people it's easy to be grateful for. Usually, they're the people that are grateful for you. And they say that all the time. I'm so grateful for this person who constantly thanks me. Well, no kidding. That's like a shocker. I mean, yeah. That's like saying, I'm so grateful for this person who gives me hundreds of dollars every Christmas. Listen, Paul's grateful for all of them. What about the person who asks you for things that are sacrificial, requires things of you? What about the person who, who says things that you just find unnecessary and annoying because they haven't grown yet in their understanding of speech as a, a, a moment of grace in their life? What, what, what about the person who doesn't show up on your ministry team and makes you do the extra work? What about the person who registered to bring one item of food at a a particular event, but then doesn't bring it and and assumes that you're going to take care of that anyway? What about the person who is distant towards you when, when you've sinned against them, but expects you to be close to them when they've sinned against you? What about the spouse who is constantly bickering towards you and demands forgiveness when you bicker towards them? What about the Christian child who is disobedient and then expects a treat at the end of their meal? It's worth asking, are we grateful for all of them? This is putting the miracle of salvation ahead of personal inconvenience. That's what this is. That's saying that that the miracle of salvation and my privilege of witnessing it is more important to me than my personal inconvenience in this person. It's a relationally transforming perspective. It transforms your perspective in the men's group when there's the individual who always seems to take the contrary position. It transforms your perspective because what you're thinking of them is not primarily in terms of their weakness, but in terms of God's grace present in their life. It's astonishing they're out of men's group. It's astonishing they want to talk about the gospel. It's astonishing they care about Jesus at all. This is a living, walking miracle. And Paul sees that in the Philippians, and it provokes him to gratefulness for all of them. Fathers, let me ask you a question. Would your children describe you as grateful for all of them? All the time. Mothers, are you grateful for all of them? All the time. Singles, are you grateful for your married friends who got married sooner than you? 
Senior saints, are, are you grateful for the rambunctious little ones who can't seem to appreciate pace in life? Middle age Christians, are, are you grateful for the zealous but perhaps still immature young Christian who is full of confidence in their opinion and, and doesn't seem to understand how much wisdom they need? Listen, you can look at all the different roles of life and see the value of this. Paul is saying, I'm grateful for all of you because I, I see the miracle that you are, the grace of God, that you have received grace and peace. I met you, Paul says, when you were just a businesswoman there who was selling cloth in Philippi. And I remember when God opened your heart to the gospel. I met you when you were a, a jail keeper imprisoning Christians. I, I met you when, when you were just a, an ordinary Roman citizen worshiping the emperor. And now you love Jesus Christ. And whatever else issues you have or conflict you have, that defines my view of you. It fills me with joy when I think of you. Do you need to grow? Yes. Do you have burdens? Yes. Are you inconvenient at times? Yes. Do you fight sometimes? Yes. Do you squabble? Yes. But what underlies all of my perspective is grateful joy. Paul has been worked on, shaken up by the gospel. And what comes out of him is gratefulness. If the gospel and its perspective is not shaking us, is not moving us on a regular basis, we'll notice a decline in in joy bubbling out of our hearts when we notice other people. One way you can tell that the gospel miracle has not been working enough on your heart recently is that your gratefulness for other people will begin to decline. You'll be like flat soda. <laughs> there, there, there's nothing there, it, it, it's flat. It's flat. Because you're more aware of their weakness and their sins and their struggles and inabilities and their inconvenience and annoyance than you are of the miracle. The gospel perspective has to work on us until when we encounter another person and we open up our mouth towards them or our perspective towards them, what bubbles out is grateful joy. That's what Paul thinks towards the Philippians. That's what we need. He is grateful. Our gratefulness and our joy reveals our true treasure. This is not a small thing. Uh, often repeated quote uh, from the dictionary of Paul in his letter says, Paul mentions the subject of thanksgiving in his letters. Listen to this. The subject of thanksgiving in his letters more often line for line than any other Hellenistic author. That's the authors of the time, pagan or Christian. Paul considers this a crucial element of Christian maturity. If you are not grateful, you are not mature. Let's let that sink in. It's a crucial element of Christian maturity. It's not an optional extra. It's not for the bubbly people. It's a crucial element of Christian maturity. Gratefulness expressed, felt, believed, because the miracle of the gospel is transforming our perspective. That's his description of gratefulness. Now let's get to the cause, the particular cause of it. In this case, I think he's thankful for what he said before, that they're saints in Christ. He's thankful that grace and peace has come to them. He's thankful for many things. But the particular cause that he first draws attention to, the effect of the gospel that he's first aware of in verse 5, is because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Very, very valuable sentence for us. Overlooked sentence, in my opinion, in the Christian church, especially in America. Overlooked sentence. Why is Paul grateful for the Philippians? Because of their partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, this word, partnership, you've probably heard from some preacher at some point, if you've been a Christian any number of years, is koinonia. It's the Greek word koinonia. It's a powerful word. It speaks of partnership. It speaks of fellowship. It speaks of camaraderie. It has the idea of, of active participants in a mission. It's this powerful, you might think of someone who throws their lot in for a, a very significant business venture with all the camaraderie and eagerness and enthusiasm and, and sacrifice that would go into a moment like that. It's their connection, it's their identity along the course of a mission. 
So he is thanking God for this partnership, this koinonia, this camaraderie on mission that he has with them, that they have with him. And this partnership is in the gospel. It is in the gospel. Here we have a a very unique way that Paul uses the word gospel. Now, at its core, the gospel is a message. God sent Jesus Christ, God the Son, to live a human life and die in the place of sinners and rise again, and anyone who believes in him will have eternal life with God, will be reconciled to God. So if you're an unbeliever, that's what that word gospel means. It means good news. God will forgive you if you believe in Jesus. But Paul also uses the word gospel to describe God's activity of reconciling the world to himself. It's it's almost like it's the title of God's salvation movement that is taking place. He'll use it in almost like it's it's an active. One commentator says it's almost like it's a personified agent. It's almost like the gospel itself is on the move. So when Paul says your, your partnership is in the gospel, he's saying he's not just, you're not just partners in, in the facts or you're not just partners academically connected to the gospels. These aren't just kind of credentials that you have. You're a part of the gospel movement that is taking place. And the only way you enter that is by believing the facts, but having believed the facts about Jesus and applied them to yourself for salvation, you are now joined into this gospel movement that is spreading around this world and claiming sinners for Jesus Christ. And the Philippians are a part of that. They've been caught up in this gospel river flowing throughout the world. And Paul is grateful. He is grateful for that. I'm grateful that you are partners with me in this gospel mission. This Christ-exalting mission. This spreading the good news mission. You are with me in this, and I am excited about that. No greater mission taking place in the earth today. No more powerful force taking place in the earth today. Paul says you are a part of God's mission to rescue sinners, men and women, boys and girls, and bring them to himself. And and you are not just watching from the sidelines. You are not even just recipients. You are participants in that mission. You are koinonia in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul is convinced that this partnership is a reason for unbridled joy, unbridled enthusiasm. He is so grateful. He is effusively grateful for the fact that these These people love and commit to and serve and sacrifice and receive from this gospel partnership. Paul's grateful he's not doing this alone. He's grateful, if you use common parlance, that we're in this together. We're in this together. He might use an English phrase. We're in this together. We're in this, this gospel movement, we're in it together. You're not watching me. You're not on the sidelines. You're not a spectator. You're in this together. You're on the field. You're in the boat. We are rowing together. I know that because I've watched over a decade now of the way you throw yourself in to this gospel mission. First locally, yes, and extra locally. I'm grateful because of your partnership, your commitment, your camaraderie, your inclusion in the gospel. And notice, it's not a temporary, momentary, isolated commitment. It's from the first day until now. Paul considers this maturity to have been a part of their ongoing Christian life. This wasn't a a season in the Philippian church where they had a a big push for missions, okay? It it wasn't like the Philippians had this, this... you know, in, hey, you know, I think in, what would it have been, uh, 59 AD, we're, we're going to do a big mission push, and we're going to get, you know, excited about Paul, and let's, let's, you know, raise some, bring in your grains, and, you know, plunk down your shekels, and we're going to send them to Paul, and it's so exciting, it's going to be fantastic. And then next year, oh, uh, yeah, Paul was last year. Paul was like a 59 thing. 
and now we're in 60 and we're moving on. No, no, that's, that's not how he describes them. He's saying, no, th this, is an ongo this is a part of what it means for the Philippians to belong to Jesus. This is not occasional. It's not extra. It's not convenient. It's not a, man, it's, it's, isn't it great that we have this opportunity to serve a guy like Paul? Well, that's, that's pretty special. I mean, if it wasn't Paul, gosh, maybe we'd move on. No, he, he considers this is part of what it means for them to be in Christ, is to be partnered together locally and extra locally with the mission of the gospel. He, he's not celebrating something in them that he considers to be optional for the rest of the church. He's celebrating something in them because he wants to inform the church of this calling that they all have. This is where I think sometimes Paul's biographical example and his method of using biography and personal relationships can be passed over as part of the calling for the Christian life. I do not think that is the right way to read the scriptures. God didn't accidentally include biographical information. It wasn't like he was stuck by the letter-writing form or the relational nature of the New Testament. It wasn't like he didn't have another way he could get across to us that we should be humble and believe the exaltation of Jesus. It wasn't like God looked down at the New Testament church and said, well, boy, I'd love we could just write doctrinal treaties and moral exhortations, but gosh, the only way to do that is to kind of put it in these letters. So for thousands of years, they're going to have to endure these opening gratefulness, and yeah, I love you, and I love you too. And then let's get to the doctrine. No, no, God, God's word is intentional in the form and the content in instructing the church. The fact that the New Testament is overwhelmingly relational, overwhelmingly interconnected, overwhelmingly extra local in its local focus is intent to impress on the church throughout the ages the calling that we have to be partners in Christ. You understand what I'm saying? This is, this is not simply a way one church should do church. This is not simply something you do if you happen to find a good buddy who's willing to go to Africa. And, no, this is not just occasional or incidental or as you have an opportunity or it's convenient to do so or you have some unique connection. No, it's a calling. It's a responsibility. It's a, it's a purpose. It's an identity. It's a koinonia that we have in Christ. We're in this together. Commentator G. Walter Hansen says this, the Philippians are actively participated in Paul's mission to spread the gospel by their prayers for him in his affliction, by their own suffering for their faith in Christ in the face of opposition, by their radiant witness, by the mission of Epaphroditus, we'll hear more about him, on their behalf to care for Paul's needs. It's not as though every Philippian Christian travels, but they are committed to somebody is going to be traveling, and we are going to make sure that happens. By the mission of Epaphroditus on their behalf to care for Paul's needs while in prison, by their regular financial support of Paul, it is important to appreciate the breadth of, of the Philippians' involvement in this partnership in the gospel so that it is not reduced to either their belief in the message of salvation in Christ or their financial support of Paul's mission to preach the gospel. Paul's mention of the first day refers to their reception of the gospel, and since that day of personal application of the gospel until now, they had continued to believe in the gospel and to support the propagation of the gospel. The Philippians' koinonia in the appropriation and proclamation of the gospel filled Paul with joyful thankfulness whenever he thought of them. Here's a question for us. Are we gratefully passionate about this same kind of partnership in the gospel today? Paul did not write verse 3 through 5 so we could applaud the Philippians from a historical distance. Good for you, Lydia, Clement, Yodia. Way to go. No. He wrote it so that we would be inspired to follow their example. Are we grateful? Are we grateful, first of all, in the most obvious way, for local partnership, local koinonia? 
I was speaking of earlier that, that we have the privilege of being partnered together locally for the mission of the gospel here in this church with one another. Paul views the koinonia of the gospel as a, a, a relational thing, even though it is also a mystical thing. So it's mystical in the sense that am I in a, a, a in Christ brother relationship with a, a brother that I don't know that is currently serving the Lord faithfully in China? Yes, I, I am. But, but for Paul, there is also intentionally this personal relational partnership where we know the names of those that we are personally and more directly partnering with. But Paul say he's in Christ and partnered, in a sense, with someone who he doesn't know in the Jerusalem church. Of course he would. But is he personally and relationally and, and more particularly connected to this Philippian church in a way that he wants to express gratefulness for? Yes, he is. And, and that's the same for us in this local context. The application of Philippians 1, 3 through 5 should certainly include a growing gratefulness that there are people in this city who believe in Jesus Christ the way you do and are willing to stand side by side with you to build a church. I don't think we're surprised enough that people are willing to do church with us. It should be surprising. And I'm called to build the church, but man, it would be a drag to build the church all by myself. Every Christian should say, and given my awareness of my own weakness and my own annoying habits, I, I could see why you'd rather build with somebody else. So I thank you. Thank you for being willing to help me fulfill what my calling is, because it's really difficult to speak the truth in love if nobody will listen to you. It's really difficult to bear the burdens of the saints if nobody wants you around them to bear their burdens. It's really difficult to admonish one another with songs and hymns and spiritual songs if no one wants to sit next to you while you sing. So, so thank you for making it possible for me to fulfill my calling to partner in the gospel. It's a calling I would have even if nobody would do it with me as a Christian. So I'm really grateful that there's people that will do it with me. It's a local partnership. It's also extra local. And in particular, I think the context here, the focus is extra local. Here's, here's a... It, an urgent point, I think, that needs to be made that is often overlooked. Is Paul grateful that the Philippians are partnered with each other? Yes, he is obviously grateful for that. He's going to make it clear in chapter 2 how important their mutual servant heart is. However, his gratefulness here is for their partnership with extra-local mission in Christ. Not just local. If I may critique many of my fellow laborers in the common American church. This isn't as present, I don't think, globally, but it is present in our country. There's an isolationist tendency of our gospel mission. We tend to think of building our own church only as being the fulfillment of our gospel partnership mission. It is not. A church that devotes all of its resources and all of its focus and all of its partnership emphasis on the building of its own partnership alone falls short of the New Testament model of faithfulness. Let me encourage you to let that sink in. A church that devotes all of its resources and all of its focus in devoting its own, building its own partnership, its own church resources, is falling short of the biblical model of faithfulness. A church that refuses to receive and benefit from the other churches in Christ is falling short of the biblical model of church humility. I, I'm not saying this because I, I, I think it's a cool way to do church. I'm saying because I, I don't know how you read Philippians and Acts all the more unless you can see this interconnectedness that takes place from one church to the other. Now, there are different ways and models from a polity standpoint that might take place. Sure, I'm not saying there's one defined structure, but, but there should definitely be in the church this extra local giving and receiving. There, there must be, if we would be faithful. It's not convenient. It's not because we think it's cool. It's not because we think extra local vision gets people excited about local service. It's because we believe it's calling of God in the scriptures. It's why we are grateful 
for the partnership God has given us with like-minded churches in our partnership in sovereign grace. It's why we are a part of this family of churches, because we believe it to be a biblical calling. It's not because we, <laughs> we think they're cool or, <laughs> you know, popular. Yeah, we look for the best speakers and the guys with the coolest, you know, pastoral wardrobe, and we went with them. Trust me, it wouldn't be sovereign grace if that was the case. <laughs> no, it, it, it's because we found in these churches people who loved the doctrines of grace who believe in the present work of the Holy Spirit, who believe in pastoral ministry leading and guiding the church, who believe in exegetical preaching from the scriptures, who believe also in church planting and global mission and not merely building our kingdoms here in this one city, and who believe in this biblical value of interconnectedness, who are willing to care about people in our church they've never met. Trust me, that's hard to find. As a pastor, I feel responsible to find other pastors and churches that we can invest in. Now, that's the easy part, knowing that that's the biblical calling that we have. The hard part is finding people that I'm sufficiently excited about to do that with a lot of energy and gusto. Because I, I want what they preach and do and care and serve to be reflecting also of some basic biblical parameters. I don't just want to send money to people who claim to be Christian. I want to know they're going to be preaching Christ and him crucified. I want to know that when they care for pastors, they're going to be speaking grace and encouragement and not condemnation and legalism. I want to know that they believe in the power of the Holy Spirit so that when they are working in that third world country, they are not doing it in their own resources. So when I send that pastor over there to Ethiopia and I send some money from our church to help him, I'm, I'm believing that he's going to do it in the power of the Spirit, preaching Christ and him crucified, building a church that is robustly biblical and exegetically preaching. I, I'm so grateful that there's men who say, that's who I am. I say, great, because I needed somebody, and I'm so glad I can send somebody like you. That's why we are a part of a family of churches. That's why we are not a, a hyper-independent church, because we, we want to fulfill this. In our book of church order, which is a kind of how we organize our family of churches, it says this. I, I wholeheartedly agree with this. No local church is omnicompetent or self-sufficient to carry out the mission which Christ has entrusted to the entire church. Each local body stands in need of other local bodies in a relationship of interdependence. This interdependence is more adequately expressed when local churches associate together in wider ecclesiastical bodies with shared resources, mission, mutual care, support, edification, and cooperation in government. Such cooperation is necessary for the protection of doctrinal fidelity. Listen, me, Bart, and Aaron believe that. We will do everything in our power to protect this church from doctrinal infidelity that tries to creep in. What we can't protect this church from is blindness in our own heart that might also creep in. And so we want to build the church into a structure so that other men who believe our same values will notice when unbeknownst to us, we begin to go astray in some small way or not notice some cultural theological danger. So we want those kind of voices speaking into us. It's necessary for the protection of doctrinal fidelity and standards of holiness, the direction of a common mission, the disposal of common funds. The members of an ecclesiastical body bear a substantial degree, listen, of corporate responsibility for the holiness and welfare of the whole. In more simple language, that means our sister church down in Seguin, I care about them, and they care about you. Members of our church just visited the church in Pearland, southeast of Houston, southwest of Houston. We care about them. They care about you. Our friend Billy Reyes, who's a pastor in Midland, I mean, you, you, you know him. How many times has he come and expressed gratefulness to individual members of this church and expressed gratefulness for them and love for them? Listen, we, we benefit from this. Many of the songs we sing are written by people in these churches because obviously there's many good songwriters in the world, but we want to have some confidence that if all the other songwriters go astray in their doctrine, we at least have some source of knowing we can get doctrinally rich in contemporary songs to sing. Listen, 
There's a church in Louisville that, that sacrifices and labors to host the pastor's college. People that help those students every year and babysit for them and help them move in and move out. They, they don't know Bart and Jessica from Adam and Eve. But when they come there, they love our church and they wanted to serve and support them. Listen, here, here's why I'm saying all this. Too often, the church is unaware of its desperate vulnerability when it is isolated. Because most of the time, if Christians go into a church, the pastor's preaching decent sermons and people are generally loving each other, and if not, you know, obviously it wouldn't be there. But the church needs this, not because they're aware of that need in a, in a functional way, but because they want to fulfill Philippians 1, 3 through 5. Listen, you want this church to be faithful. This is part of what faithfulness looks like. It seemed an opportunity this morning to talk about how we are seeking to fulfill on your behalf and with you this calling that we have. And I, I pray that this is a heart that you have as well. I pray that you are not a Christian only concerned for the well-being of this church. Yes, concerned, but not only concerned. With, with a, like the Philippians had, somebody in the Philippian church was thinking, Man, it's not just about how children's ministry is going and the youth ministry. We, what's going on with Paul? We, let's, let's, use some, let's send somebody. Uh, boy, Paphroditus, he, he leads the ushers. Oh, gosh, that's going to be rough. Somebody else is going to have to step up. I know, but we've got to help Paul. Let's send him. We can't do without him. He's like one of our most competent guys. In the, he does everything. I know, but we've we got to think outside of ourselves, too. That's what the Philippian church did. That's what Paul is explosively grateful for. I believe that if Paul were present today, we would want him to be as explosively grateful about us as he is about the Philippian church. Sometimes I have this, this thought that comes to mind, either on a Sunday or different moments. What would Paul think if he stepped into this church? Ultimately, you know, what would God think? ultimately. But Paul's the apostle, and he's the one writ, wrote a lot of letters, so it's a, there's a humanizing nature to him. So we, I think that, okay, what, what, would Paul, what would Paul think what we're doing right now? Okay, I, I think he'd be excited. We're preaching the scriptures. We're preaching the gospel. We're preaching his letters. We're pre- I, 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 think, I, I think he'd say yes and amen. Would he say yes and amen to our extra local passion? I pray he would. We're seeking to do this. We want you as pastors to not just trust us in the doing of this, which we're grateful you do, but to be concerned about and want to know that this is happening and how you can be a part of it too. It's one thing to trust your pastors when they, you know, send some money here, send some money. It's another thing to to have that be one of the questions that comes up in the membership class. Do Do you all serve and support other churches? and representatives of the gospel. How how do you do that? Because that's part of church faithfulness. And to be excited like Paul when you find out that that's taking place. We give 10% of our income to this partnership to support a number of things. Church plants like Joel Shorey in Newark, Delaware, Walt Alexander, a friend of mine in Athens, Tennessee, Joel Bain and Sheldon Campbell in Kingston, Jamaica, Joshua Earl in Wilmington, South Carolina. We provide pastoral help and care for a man like Fabiano Medeiros in Sao Paulo, Brazil, another friend of mine who's seeking to start a church there. We serve and support Carlos Contreras and the Brothers in Juarez, Mexico. It's this pastor's conference that they're now doing every year for pastors throughout Mexico. Our region, in a particular way, is going to be financially supporting that conference this year and trying to take responsibility to serve and support what Carlos and those guys is doing. We support helping churches in the middle of, of crisis and difficulty. We support people who write and produce Sovereign Grace music that reflects our values and that we can sing confidently. We support global missions, providing pastoral help to our brother in Nepal, Barnabas, planting a new church like in Ethiopia, 
the work that Michael Granger is doing, su supporting, uh, as I said, the, the, the people in Brazil. There's work that, that Dave Taylor, a friend of mine and friend of ours, is doing from Sydney where he's serving pastors in the Philippines and teaching them some of our shared values of sovereign grace. Isn't that exciting? There's a pastor that we know and trust who's sitting down with pastors in the Philippines who are so humble and asking for doctrinal training. And what's he telling them? What's coming out of his mouth? Now, we paid for some of that plane ticket. What's coming out of his mouth? Churches should be about Christ and him crucified. Churches should support pastoral leadership. Churches should be about reformed theology, the doctrines of grace in Christ. Churches should be about the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what's coming out of his mouth. I am I'm so grateful and privileged that we get to be a part of that moment in the Philippines or in Seoul, Korea or in Liberia or in other places around the world, England, Germany. I, I'm so grateful that, that we're a part of that. I believe we're called to be a part of that. And by the grace of God and by the kindness of these brothers around the world, they, they allow us to connect with them. They allow us to put our name, Redemption Hill Church, our mark in what they're doing so that we can be faithful to Philippians 1, 3 through 5, so that we can get to heaven and hear first the Lord, and then I think Paul say, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I want to hear that for us. Imagine if you would, in the 1880s, a mason works with stone, he works in some masonry pit somewhere in central Texas. And he labors and labors and labors different projects. And he puts a mark on those stones as they go out. And one day, a government official comes to his pit and draws him up and says, Today, I want you to come and see something. He travels with him down to the center of the state, down Congress Avenue. And there, there is the Texas Capitol. He takes him right to the foundation. And he says, I want you to see this. And there is one of his stones with his mark on it. And he says to him, I, I just wanted you to know that you are a part of this. Your name is on what is going on right here. And I am so grateful for that. You are playing a part in what we are doing here. You are playing a part in what people will be seeing for a hundred years. Listen, the Lord Jesus, Paul, is wanting the same thing for us. Taking us by the hand, taking us around the world. Look, look here in Liberia, look in Ethiopia, look, look in Germany, look in England, look in Seoul, Korea, look, look over here in the Philippines, look in Sydney, look, look in Mexico, look in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Look, look, look here in California, look at Wilmington, look at Newark, look, look, you are a part of that. Look here at, in Midland, look here in Seguin, look, look here in Pearland, look here in El Paso, look, look here in Frisco, look, look, look right here, look, look, your mark. You, you are a part of that. If you are faithful here, and you are giving here, and you are supporting here, and you are encouraging here, and you are defending the gospel here, and you are praying here, and you are suffering here for Christ, you are a part of that. Let me tell you how excited I am that you are a part of that. To your eternal honor before the Lord Jesus Christ, who died not just to save the Christians in our church, but Christians around the world, you are a part of that. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always, in every prayer of mine, making my prayer with joy. Why? Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Redemption Hill Church, we're in this with those brothers and sisters, these brothers and these sisters, we're in this together to the unending glory of God. Gospel partnership should produce abundant gratefulness. Let's pray.
Lord Jesus, we are so honored, so honored, Lord, that you allow us to be a part of the church you are building. Lord, we do not deserve this honor. We do not deserve it, Lord, but you have given it to us. You have extended to us this privilege. So, Lord, lift our eyes beyond ourselves, beyond our circumstances, beyond our suffering, beyond our difficulties, and let us see the privilege we have to walk among miracles of grace and to partner with them around the world. Lord, let it bubble over in gratefulness. Let it transform our daily, ordinary, routine lives. Lord, take us out of the ordinary and take us to a vision of this privilege. And let it transform our perspective. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this privilege and for all of those partners around the world. We love them, bless and keep them, strengthen them by your power and keep them faithful to your gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.